Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Unfortunately, Dr. Page is not feeling very well, uh, so I will have the honor of introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Amish Ravel. Uh, Amish went to medical school at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, where he stayed for his residency in internal medicine and his fellowship in cardiovascular medicine. Then he went to Georgetown University for a fellowship in interventional cardiology, and he did an interprural postdoc fellowship with the NIH when he was there. In 2005, he was recruited to UW as an assistant professor on the CHS track, and very soon after arriving, he demonstrated uh, exceptional research skills, and it was clear that tenure track was more appropriate for him. So he was transferred to tenure track, and soon after that uh, was promoted to associate professor of medicine. Uh, Dr. Raval's research is really focused on two main areas. One is creating a better imaging platform for catheter-based interventions. He is very passionate about patients with structural heart disease and has been working with our radiology colleagues, combining both cardiac MR and fluoroscopy uh, to, to be provide better imaging for patients who have uh, structural heart disease. In addition to this, he's been working on stem cell uh, therapy, and he's been uh, very innovative uh, working on new ways to deliver stem cell therapy, including both intravenous and intrapural injections. And he's been doing this by leveraging his skills in cardiac imaging and also his skills as an interventional cardiologist. His research has been supported both by the NIH and industry. He's been the uh, PI on two large trials and helped create here the Options Clinic, which is a clinic here at UW that serves for uh, two purposes. One is providing a second opinion for patients with advanced heart disease and peripheral vascular disease who are uh, seeking a, 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 a additional therapy for, for their problems. And second, as a database, which is key for uh, future trials. His work so far has resulted in 52 publications. He's first author on 10 and senior author on 14, and he has also written eight book chapters. In addition to his research efforts, uh, Amish has been also a great uh, citizen. Uh, he, since 2001, he's been our STEMI program director, and he has received in uh, three years in a row the AHA uh, Get With The Guidelines Platinum Award for delivering excellent care for patients coming in with uh, STEMI. He also helped develop the TAVR program that he's going to talk about today, and he's been the chair and the organizer of the TAVI Symposium, and we've had now uh, three, counting this one, uh, Amish, and it's been a great success and a great example how we can collaborate with our surgical colleagues to deliver uh, excellent care. At the end of the NIH Production Assistance for Cellular Therapy Steering Committee, he was the chair of the 8th Annual Wisconsin Stem Cell Symposium. He's the co-chair of the University of Wisconsin Production Assistance for Cellular Therapies Workshop a Clinical Care Cardiology Council, and a journal, including the journal editor for the American, and he's a member of just working with the aortic valve uh, replacement and the program that's been here at UW now for several years. Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming to attend this uh, uh, talk. Uh, so we're not going to talk about stem cells. We're going to talk about the aortic valve. And um, here are my disclosures. Uh, you know, I don't have any personal financial disclosures that are relevant, but just to let you know, we're involved with a lot of research trials with a lot of different companies. The only uh, research trial that we're involved with, as I am a co-investigator of, is the Partner 2 trial uh, sponsored by Edwards Life Sciences, which is a valve company. Um, today, we're going to talk about transcatheter aortic valve replacement. I'll start off by talking about the background and uh, clinical presentation of aortic valve stenosis. The transcatheter valve procedure will be highlighted. I'll talk to you about outcomes, uh, and I'll have the privilege of representing our team as it relates to the outcomes of the TAVR program here at UW, and a couple of case examples of the types of patients that we see now routinely. Uh, who benefit from this procedure. This is the organ that we're talking about. It's quite a unique and interesting and remarkable design. This is the aortic valve. It's got uh, three, in its normal form, three cusps, uh, three layers to it. It's highly cellular. It's got a matrix. It's got an innervation, and it's got a perfusion uh, method uh, of uh, perfusing the tissue. So it's a very active organ. It's suspended by the aortic root, and of course it separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Um, the uh, valve has to endure 
uh, a pulse pressure of between 40 and 60 millimeters of mercury over every heartbeat over an entire person's lifetime. So pretty remarkable organ. When things bad happen to that aortic valve, it usually manifests in two ways. One, the valve doesn't open very well, and that's called aortic valve stenosis. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, the other way is if it doesn't close very well, um, it can leak, and that's called aortic insufficiency. We're not going to talk about that, but do know that many patients with aortic valve stenosis and aortic insufficiency cross-pollinate, so you can actually have both. Um, a, both congenital and acquired conditions can cause aortic valve stenosis. This is a case of uh, a patient where the bicusp with a bicuspid aortic valve. This is a case of rheumatic fever causing a rheumatic uh, aortic valve stenosis. In addition, once the valve is replaced with a bioprosthesis, that bioprosthesis can endure uh, calcification and further uh, degeneration, and that can, once removed, look something like this, where the bioprosthetic leaflets don't open. But today, we're really going to focus on the most common cause of aortic valve stenosis, and that's an age-related, some people call it senile calcific aortic valve stenosis. So this is a case example, this is an example, autopsy example of this, where the patient had a, uh, um, th a three-cusp leaflet um, design here with uh, uh, aortic valve calcification and nodules. So this is the most common cause of aortic valve stenosis, and as we talk about aortic valve stenosis, killer entity, um, because this is the most common and is really what's uh, uh, approved for us to be uh, 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 repairing as uh, it relates to transcatheter valve replacement. So what's the prevalence of aortic valve stenosis? Well, it's really a little bit unclear, uh, probably underreported, but, but based on some Medicare sampling, uh, about 2.5 million Americans over the age of 75 uh, have a presentation of aortic, aortic valve stenosis. Again, probably underrepresented because many people walk around with mild, moderate, or even severe aortic valve stenosis and never seek uh, medical attention. They just don't know that they have it. Um, about a third of those patients um, have severe aortic valve stenosis, and uh, three quarters of those have severe symptomatic. Um, only 60% of those patients who have severe symptomatic aortic valve stenosis end up being referred for surgical valve replacement. So that is a, suggests that this is a highly prevalent and undertreated uh, condition. That means that 40% of people do not have, undergo any sort of valve replacement. Uh, why is that? Well, there's a variety of reasons, and we'll kind of go through why many patients are not candidates for surgical AVR. In terms of the pathophysiology, there's a lot of different processes involved uh, at the cellular level, um, as well as um, based on my biomechanical forces. There are a lot of similarities between aortic valve stenosis and atherosclerosis, which typically affects blood vessels, including coronary arteries. Um, and those uh, processes include um, endothelial cell um, activation, uh, the immune system with macrophages, um, microcalcifications that can occur and macrocalcifications that can occur in both uh, conditions. Uh, indeed, the risk factors to both conditions, atherosclerosis and aortic valve stenosis, can be shared. So for example, uh, men with diabetes who have dyslipidemia, who smoke and have hypertension uh, have a uh, can have both of these conditions. Uh, so these things do, are similar in many respects. What's been the disconnect is the therapy for both are quite uh, dissimilar. So ways of trying to prevent atherosclerosis that have been effective, including uh, exercise, certain diets, and uh, medications like statins, have not been shown to be consistently effective for preventing aortic valve stenosis. And so far today, in 2016, I guess now, uh, we don't have any sort of preventative therapy for aortic valve uh, stenosis. But when it does uh, become severe, that's when problems happen. Eventually, that stenotic valve will impose a load on the left ventricle. Uh, that left ventricle will hypertrophy. Uh, in later stages, it'll dilate because it just gives up. Um, there's myocardial ischemia, the wall tension associated with the uh, extra pressure on the inner surface prevents coronary perfusion, and if you already have coronary artery disease, that leads to further myocardial ischemia. Uh, the end result of this can be pulmonary edema, pulmonary hypertension. It can back up onto the right ventricle, lead to right ventricular overload and biventricular dysfunction. And of course, the culmination of both ventricles not working very well leads to a, a low reduced cardiac output. In terms of clinical presentation, we all know about the triad. The triad is uh, shortness of breath, uh, 
syncope, and angina. And that's the classical teaching for many years and really hasn't changed much. These are the types of things that happen to people who have severe aortic valve stenosis. But what we're learning as part of the TAVR program is that many patients just simply don't themselves report these things. They have learned to adapt their lifestyle to kind of recline back. And, uh, and if you're not doing much, because all of these symptoms are typically associated with exertion, if you're not doing much, you're not necessarily going to experience syncope or presyncope, uh, shortness of breath or angina, just because you're mostly sedentary. But being sedentary leads to other problems. And so one of the common presentations that we're seeing is this concept of frailty. This is a concept that's been around for a long period of time, um, and uh, it's something that we're, it's become the forefront of this procedure. And we'll talk to, you, uh, talk to you in a little bit about how we reconcile frailty as it relates to poor surgical outcomes and candidacy for TAVR. Um, there are other presentations that are maybe lesser discussed. Um, sometimes patients present with a, a GI bleeding. Typically, it's upper GI bleeding related to uh, angiodysplasia, um, and that's a condition called Hades disease. Uh, once you fix the aortic valve stenosis, a lot of times that gets better. So GI bleeding is one of the manifestations of aortic valve stenosis. Uh, another uh, presentation that we're seeing in the clinic is just a new onset heart murmur. Unfortunately, sometimes the presentation is, is less um, uh, easy to find. It's an incidental finding on an echo. Uh, and it's a shame that, that that has occurred because it would have been an easy diagnosis um, if you just listen by, with a stethoscope. But nevertheless, we, this is how we are finding these people. So to prevent us seeing an incidental finding on an echo, I've got this auscultation for us to all hear, okay? So this is how we're going to listen to aortic valve stenosis. When we examine a patient for aortic valve stenosis, of course we go through the entire systems and we look at the JVP and we look for right ventricular heave and palpate and all that stuff. And that's all very good. But the, the in, in my experience, and I think this is kind of the experience of many, um, the best way of di distinguishing between mild and severe aortic valve stenosis is on the auscultative properties um, and, and the most consistent. And so let's, um, the best way that this works is for all of us to close our eyes, okay, because you'll tune out extraneous things if you close your eyes and just listen. And what I want you to focus on when you hear this sound is that you hear a very crisp S2, right? The second heart sound is, is audible. In between the first and second heart sound, you hear a noise. And that noise has a kind of a diamond shape amplitude to it. It's early peaking. And uh, this is, would be a mild aortic valve stenosis. If I heard this in the clinic, I wouldn't necessarily rush to getting an echo, okay? On the other hand, let's keep your eyes closed now. This is gonna be severe aortic valve stenosis. Whoops, hang on a second. All right, you hear the difference? So now, first, first heart sounds sort of okay. Second heart sounds pretty much inaudible. And the amplitude of the murmur kind of accelerates as you get through towards the thing. There is still a little bit of a gap, you know, where S2 should be. So this is not mitral regurgitation, because mitral regurgitation, you just kind of blow into S, the, where S2 should be. But this is a second, this is a severe aortic valve stenosis. Best heard in the aortic area, the right second intercostal space. Sometimes you can hear it radiate into the carotids associated with a dampened pulse amplitude. So nobody should be sending people for an echo without and discovering aortic valve stenosis because you should have figured that out before, okay? So now if you do get the echo to confirm, and that's really what it's meant for is to confirm, um, there are parameters on the echo that we look for and we're primarily looking at the uh, Doppler signal and the aortic vo velocity. And we're looking for a velocity of greater than four meters per second and that's the University of Societies as what is consistent with uh, severe aortic valve stenosis. Two-thirds of people who have severe aortic valve stenosis will have a, a valve gradient uh, of greater than uh, 40 or a velocity of over four. There's a mathematical relationship between velocity and gradient, so don't be misled that those are two different numbers. Uh, 
Um, but there's two other conditions that you should be aware of, and they comprise about a third of the people that we see in the echo lab. Um, those who have a low flow, low gradient, reduced ejection fraction. That is, the left ventricle is so dysfunctional, the reduction fraction is so reduced, that it cannot generate enough power to uh, be able to detect a gradient through what would appear to be a stenotic aortic valve. And so the typical findings are a lower ejection fraction and a low, low gradient as a result. Now, they still have aortic valve stenosis and they would still benefit from that being replaced, but that's the, the presentation. Um, there's an, another way that these patients can present, and it's called paradoxical low flow, low gradient, normal ejection fraction, aortic valve stenosis. And uh, these are patients where the uh, velocity jet is similarly low, uh, the gradient is low, but the ejection fraction is normal. And the fundamental problem here is that the left ventricle can't fill sufficiently uh, Go see. It's probably just. The put is low. And the way we distinguish between this uh, and just having a low flow state just because of this scenario versus air valve stenosis is by looking at the stroke volume. And if the stroke volume is quite low, um, less than 35 is the number that's quoted, uh, associated with a severely thickened valve, and on a CT, if it's heavily calcified, then um, that would be in keeping with aortic valve stenosis, okay? Now, if you have severe aortic valve stenosis, uh, people can plot along for a long time until they start to have symptoms. And this is the classical teaching about aortic valve stenosis. Once you have symptoms, then the rug comes out from under you, okay? Then you start, then the clock starts. And uh, this, the triad of symptoms, angina, syncope, and heart failure, correspond to 50% uh, mortality at between two to five years. And so things start to kind of really deteriorate it, uh, at the onset of symptoms. But what's lesser known is that asymptomatic people with aortic valve stenosis also have a pretty poor outcome. And this was a recent study uh, published in Jack in uh, December, probably the best uh, series that kind of talks about this issue, where they took a, a, a prospective registry in Japan, and uh, it was a 291 patients who, uh, who initially underwent AVR. In a non-randomized fashion, they found uh, 1,500 patients who formed a, his, the uh, background cohort which were just observed for conservative therapy, and then once symptoms developed, may have gone on to develop, uh, had aortic valve stenosis. So it is a retrospective, so be mindful. It's, uh, sorry, it's a prospective registry, but it's non-randomized, so be mindful of the constraints of that. There was propensity matching done, so a, a cohort of 291 patients within this larger cohort were discovered to have similar confounding, vari similar variables to avoid confounding. Um, and, uh, and the results are here. So if you underwent an initial AVR, your mortality was lower than if you went through a conservative approach um, initially. So really the sort of the first kind of data that uh, tells us that we really should be thinking about um, uh, either closer monitoring of patients who have severe valve stenosis or really probing them to see if they're truly asymptomatic. So I think that's the lesson here, not necessarily that people with asymptomatic severe AS all should undergo surgery. Just a, a highlight that um, uh, things don't, aren't uh, a bed of roses just because you're asymptomatic. Now, um, when you do have severe aortic stenosis, it's a pretty ominous thing. If you're not operated upon, if you don't have that valve replaced, your mortality is pretty poor and, and worse than many forms of uh, metastatic cancer. Um, the treatment is really as a mechanical prof, a replacement can either be a mechanical valve or a tissue valve. With the advent of transcatheter valve replacement, more and more people are putting in tissue valves knowing that there is a future if that valve degenerates in 10 years, that there is a possibility of putting in a transcatheter valve within a new valve. So, so just be mindful of that. Now, if they're not a candidate for, for surgery, and we'll go through why they may not be, then we're stuck. 
And then we're really, we're really stuck with uh, what we would consider a palliative approach, where we can kind of buy time with uh, you know, judicious use of diuretics. That'll work only so far until they develop kidney dysfunction and other things. We can also do balloon aortic valvuloplasty, um, a procedure that we used to do rarely. Now we do much more commonly as bridges to future things. But it is a palliative procedure still. There is some morbidity associated with it. It's certainly not in a major involved procedure. It's not a, as big a deal as it um, as used to be kind of thought of. But, um, but it really will only buy a few months. So that's why we consider it palliative, okay? So aortic valve replacement is the definitive uh, procedure. Now, how do we decide who is a candidate for aortic valve replacement? Well, there's a variety of tools and surgeons, you know, who, cardiac surgeons who do this for a living, um, have learned to use these tools and also their clinical acumen. Um, one of the more commonly used tools is the STS score. The, Sur the Society of Thoracic Surgeons has for many years um, uh, entered and logged in uh, data from around the country related to surgical outcomes uh, in a variety of centers who've uh, subscribed to this um, registry. And uh, in a quarterly manner, they, pr they pr publish results. And those results are in incorporated within a, a scoring regimen that you can then use to, on your individual patient, predict what their surgical uh, in-hospital outcomes are going to be. And so what we usually get is a variety, a list of things of percentage of uh, likely morbidity or mortality. Mortality alone is what we think about as the STS score, but you get all these other uh, potential um, factors that may influence your decision on whether or not they're a surgical candidate. There are a variety of things that are embedded within the STS score, like the patient's age, their gender, their race, actually. Um, if they have concomitant coronary artery disease, their functional classification is a long list of things, and it takes a little while to kind of go through all of it, but um, it's worth it, and you get, you get a score. But there are a number of things that are not included in a score and are a little harder to kind of quantitate. Um, and surgeons know this, they just know their training and what we're learning as interventionalists and cardiologists is that there are a variety of things that we do look at now. Frailty is one of those things. Now there are some ways of trying to objecti objectify uh, frailty, we can just look at them. You know, that patient I showed you earlier, the frail lady, you can just tell. So that's the eyeball test. Uh, you can shake their hand and if the hand grip, you know, I don't know if we're supposed to do that anymore with glove, you know, gelling and stuff, but, you know, like a fist pump or something, but, um, uh, but nevertheless, some of us still do shake hands, and, uh, and you know, your, your hand grip is, uh, you know, thought to be maybe a, a way. There's a formal kind of device that you can use that is a tension meter that tells you about hand grip strength. You can look at their serum albumin as a kind of measure of their uh, nutritional status and have them walk for five meters and time them. And, you know, when you're post-call, you may fail this test, too. But, you know, these patients uh, um, are, who are frail have a hard time, you know, resolving that. So, so these are sort of uh, frailty measures that are still in kind of development. And none of these are um, kind of have become mainstream and in, in, in sort of um, standardized yet. But uh, a lot of us use these things to kind of make an overall assessment. There are some mechanical factors that are purely uh, related to the technical problem of doing an open heart surgery. Hostile chest, a hostile aorta. Um, this is an example of a porcelain aorta. There's, there's no place to cross clamp this thing, okay? That's, um, that would make surgery difficult and impossible. Um, uh, oxygen dependent lung disease is not included in this typical escort. Child's pub, uh, child's pub liver cirrhosis, um, C is probably too far. Um, and A is probably reasonable, but B is probably high risk. Um, RV dysfunction, something that we're, we're learning about here at UW. Um, one of the residents, um, Ashish Chada, is doing a study uh, that is going to be quantifying RV dysfunction and seeing how it relates to uh, outcomes. Um, and uh, also uh, relying on arms for mobility, you know, so patients who have degenerative joint disease of the legs, uh, who are really dependent on leaning on their walker, they're not going to do well with this open sternotomy. Um, and also a couple of other things. People who have a very small um, L left ventricular outflow tract, when you put in a, a surgical implant, you have a sewing ring. That sewing ring itself takes purchase and can restrict your outflow tract even further. And if you have a really small outflow tract, even though the leaflets within that prosthetic valve are, are opening and closing, that's called a patient prosthesis mismatch. You will still have a residual gradient, and patients may continue to have symptoms 
uh, what would be considered functional aortic valve stenosis um, as a result. These transcatheter valves that you will see have the best effective orifice area of any valve prosthesis around now. So uh, for patients with small LVLT, the, that, that may be something we want to consider. And then, of course, if the previous aortic valve has failed, a prosthetic valve, uh, it is now indicated to put in a transcatheter valve. So these are a variety of uh, factors that we kind of factor in when we talk about eligibility. When we look at the devices, there are only two FDA-approved uh, devices that are commercially available in the United States. The first uh, product was from Edwards Life Sciences that was FDA-approved in 2012 in January, and it's the Sapien valve. Uh, this is a cobalt chromium cardial tissue onto it. The generations of the Sapien valve did not have this outer skirt. Alternative valve made by a to be crimped on a balloon. Coronary certainly don't want to have coronary arteries. So that would be a disaster. So these are all clinical factors. We won't get into too much detail. This is how the procedure is done. So nowadays we get percutaneous access. Uh, we advance the delivery sheath first. There's a sheath here, and then through that, the delivery system comes up. Right now, to maintain a low profile, the balloon actually leads ahead of the valve. So the valve is down here, the balloon's here. So in the body, we have to retract the balloon into the valve um, in order to... Um, now, now it's at a higher profile, and so to get out, it would be chopping around um, to the aortic arch, uh, carefully, you know, the wire has already been pre previously crossed across the aortic valve. And then we get into this uh, diseased aortic valve annulus. Now, surprisingly, most people tolerate this tube getting into a stenotic aortic valve pretty well. We try to center the valve. These devices have some, this particular device has a, a way of uh, uh, securing that, um, that valve and trying to center it. We. Uh, uh, position the valve um, under fluoroscopy in combination with echocardiography, and um, we actually do uh, serial aortic uh, valve, um, aortic root injections to kind of get the right procedure, right perspective. You'll see the heart quiver, and that's because we pace the heart at a very rapid rate, upwards of 160 to sometimes 200 beats per minute for a short duration of time. The valve is implanted in this particular valve in the, in the annular position here, and um, the patient goes home that day. No, I'm just kidding. No, they, they, go, they, uh, they go home uh, usually within about three days, all right? So that, uh, that's done. Now, the other valve, as mentioned, is a little different. That's the Medtronic. This is the Medtronic valve. It's a self-expanding valve. The delivery system is uh, placed across similar size. Um, it's uh, retracted. The delivery uh, tube is retracted, and the valve is, it flares out on its own. Uh, one nice thing about this particular valve is before it's released, you know, when it's kind of one-third or two-thirds released, you can actually retract it. You can actually put it back in and recapture it. So if you didn't like the positioning, so for example, if it dropped right into the left ventricle or too high, you can, um, you can retract it and kind of reposition it. So that is an advantage of this particular valve. Uh, so currently in 2016, we have two indications for um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, and these indications match the way the clinical trials were designed. We have prohibitive risk and high-risk patients. High risk is defined by 8 to 15 percent estimated in-hospital mortality, typically by the STS score or by the heart team, taking into account all of those factors that are maybe not included within the STS score. Prohibitive risk is where we started, and those are patients typically we're looking at an in-hospital mortality of greater than 15 percent where surgery was usually turned down. Uh, other factors that make them prohibitive would be like that porcelain aorta we talked about, child's pub, uh, liver cirrhosis, et cetera. So these are currently FDA approved. Uh, as we move forward, we are eager to find out the results of the intermediate risk cohort. We are part of that clinical trial. The results, the final um, results are still pending. But um, here we're studying patients that have an STS score between 4 and 8 percent. And currently there are clinical trials under development to look at the low risk patient population. So as you can see, um, there really isn't much else. 
you know, beyond this. So uh, we still don't yet know how we're going to treat bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. Rheumatic aortic valve stenosis probably fits a pattern similar to this, so that's probably something we'll be okay with, um, et cetera. But these are, this is kind of the evolution. Uh, so here's us being able to implant in all these. So currently, we have an open access registry. So if you have patients that are considered intermediate risk, we can, through a registry, do, um, do their procedure uh, open label. And um, they just have to consent to being, um, uh, have their information sent to a, a registry. Uh, so the way that it's, it's done is uh, we, uh, in the vast majority of cases now, up to about 70, 75% of cases, close the artery on the or extremities that looks like to come in through here and created And if you look at comparative um, types of things like hemodialysis at $70,000 and an ICD for primary prevention, you know, in this range, this would seem to be cost effective. The bulk of the cost that's, you know, generated by TAVR in comparison to surgical aortic valve stenosis is, entire, is in, almost entirely related to the valve cost. So in the first um, iteration of the valves, those valves cost about $30,000 per pop. Um, compared to a valve implant, which is about four or five thousand dollars. So, so all of the cost was in. in, in and just to kind of keep it very brief, uh, TAVR was shown to be non-inferior to surgical ABR for the second generation device, because by this time we were up to second generation devices. So we don't see any significant differences in terms of death by intention to treat or as treated. But we do see a slightly increased risk of uh, stroke with the uh, TAVR in this high-risk population with this particular second-generation valve compared to surgical air valve replacement. So that has to be factored in. But we see major bleeding as being significantly reduced, and that's pretty obvious because surgical air valve replacement is open thoracotomy um, on pump with cardioplegia and the whole thing. So, um, so stroke is something that has to be a consideration. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the outcomes, uh, this is the core valve, this is a Medtronic product. If you look at their high-risk um, uh, data, uh, we see that the surgical uh, valve replacement um, uh, group actually had a slightly better mortality than the previous um, Sapien valve, uh, and statistically significantly, the uh, TAVR population here actually did better. So while it was designed to be a non-inferior design, they actually showed superiority with TAVR in a high-risk population. And that, this is what led to, the, this is their pivotal trial, led to their approval. Um, as, we, as time has gone on, the valves have gotten better. The, uh, the profile of the valve started off at 24 and 22 French. That's about the size of my thumb, 24 French. And now we're down to 14 French, which is about the size of my little finger. All right, so, so it's gotten a lot, lot better. Um, just to give you a perspective, um, when we do a valvuloplasty, we're usually putting in about a 10 French um, uh, sheath. So, so not much different than that. Uh, and that's with the latest generation valves. As we think about the um, last, the final generation valve, this S3, which is the Edwards um, product, uh, and we look at the high-risk patients using the best valve that we have, um, and if we look at that data as a comparison, their STS score in those patients were 8.6%. We see that the outcomes with the S3 valve in a high-risk population are extremely low. Okay, so the predicted mortality was 8.6%. The actual mortality is 2.2% uh, all-cause. Um, the uh, UW mortality as it relates to this population that we've experienced here is even lower than that. So we've had a good run. Uh, the STS score, you know, is um, sort of the t transcatheter valve replacement is being applied in a variety of places and variety of institutions. Here we are in Wisconsin, so there's six centers in Wisconsin currently. We have data um, that is generated from the STS score across all the different sites up to 2013. And if we see all-cause mortality at discharge here and 30-day all-cause mortality, if we compare the 30-day all-cause mortality at UW, we had an amazing run for a long time. And then more recently, last fall, we had one uh, procedural death. 
So we've done a pretty good job, I think, in terms of patient identification, team approach, um, and um, post-procedural care. Uh, the intermediate risk is an interesting population. These are patients that would, are a very common population for surgeons to just do, you know, their surgery. So we don't have the full data yet on the uh, Partner 2 intermediate risk cohort. That, you know, the follow-up phase, it's close to enrollment, but we do have some in preliminary 30-day information suggesting that at 30 days, with a predicted population of between 4 and 8%, so they ended up having 5.3% surgical mortality prediction, their surgical outcome, the, sorry, TABR outcomes were extremely low in terms of mortality. And for us, in the couple of dozen patients that we have had so far with intermediate risk, our mortality is so far zero. So we've done a pretty good job in that too. Um, functional class in that intermediate risk at 30 days has actually improved significantly. So less of the uh, yellow and orange, you know, at baseline and more of the green is a good thing. Um, at 30 days in both the high risk and the intermediate risk population. So, so we're reducing mortality and we're improving outcomes um, significantly. And then over the course, to summarize, over the course of the evaluations of all the trials and all the learning curves and the heart team approach and so on, we're seeing a dramatic reduction in, 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 in improvement in outcomes. Uh, this is designed to show the differences in the valves, but really it's probably just not only just the valves that have gotten better, but the um, procedural um, outcomes are better because of better selection and team approach and better post-op care and so on. Now, it's not all a bed of roses. Uh, complications can still occur. Um, there is a risk of um, a leakage around the valve once it's implanted. That's called paravalvular regurgitation. For a prohibitive risk person, a little bit of leak is probably not such a big deal, you know. They weren't going to have anything. Their mortality curve was pretty poor. For a low risk or an intermediate risk person, a little bit of leak actually may confirm some late term uh, worsening outcomes. So that's something we're going to have to remember as we move forward. And there's a variety of other, you know, potential problems that um, are common associated with the uh, transcatheter valve, like AV block, we kind of pinch on the conduction system, um, put pressure and cause inflammation, and that can lead to pacemakers. But the rest of it has actually become far, far uh, less common uh, now that the valve designs have gotten better, profiles gotten better, and so on. So really, uh, the, the reason why things are getting better and why we seem to be succeeding so well is because of our multidisciplinary heart team approach. And I've had the privilege of being involved with some really fantastic people who've really shown not just their expertise, but their frank compassion for the management of these patients. It all starts, you know, with the referring doc um, who sends a patient, considers the transcatheter valve as a possibility. We evaluate them in the outpatient clinic. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary clinic where we have a surgeon and an interventional cardiologist there along with uh, nurse providers. We do some uh, phase of screening uh, that includes a cath, a CT scan, a carotid ultrasound, uh, as well as some pulmonary function tests. Um, we get them to see their dentist to make sure they don't have any active abscesses. And then we discuss all of their information, their history, their functional classification, and their imaging in a multidisciplinary valve conference that's attended by, uh, patient, by uh, the various folks I mentioned, including anesthesiologists, echocardiographers, nursing staff, and so on. Um, we then make a decision as to whether or not they're a candidate and what particular nuances we may have, you know, uh, about that patient, you know, their anticoagulation strategy and so on. Many of these patients are on warfarin, for example. Um, the patient's educated as what our recommendation is. Then the, the actual procedure happens. This process can take, you know, two, two weeks, three weeks in that, in that time range. Um, the procedure happens, um, uh, in, and we'll talk about that in a second, but um, typically it's about a three-day in-hospital stay for if we're doing a transfemoral approach, about a four- or five-day in-hospital stay if it's an alternative access approach. They get a little bit of in-hospital rehab during that with physical therapy. They're <laughs> referred for outpatient cardiac rehab once they're discharged, and uh, then they're followed up in our clinic at one month and one year in the valve clinic, so it all kind of circles around. So, um, so this, this does not work if we don't have good communication and um, good uh, linking between uh, the various um, uh, stakeholders here. This is our uh, room, uh, our current hybrid uh, operating uh, procedure room. 
Uh, we call it, we interchange between a hybrid cath lab and a hybrid OR, depending on who you are. If you're a surgeon, you call it a hybrid OR. If you're an interventional cardiologist, it's a hybrid cath lab. But nevertheless, it's the same room. And uh, what you see here, <laughs> it's a, um, uh, an image intense, uh, not an image, a digital x-ray system here with a large display that can feed in ultrasound imaging, hemodynamic imaging, anesthesia-related imaging, anesthesia carts back here. The room is large. Uh, we have um, perfusion equipment in the background, so we have um, a, an ECMO circuit. We can pull in um, cardiopulmonary bypass circuit as well, just in case things don't go don't go right. So it's all done here, and this you know this is a picture taken with an earlier picture, but it's about this many people in the room still. You know, we still have a lot of people, a lot of folks, a lot of different areas of expertise, and really this is key to making sure that the patient does well from beginning to end. And in terms of some landmarks that are specific to UW, uh, our first case was in January of 2012. And since that period of time, you know, um, we have done very well. We had our first uh, valve symposium. We realized that this was an early thing back then. And um, we wanted to learn from others and we thought others could learn from us. And so we put together a valve symposium that's kind of a regional valve symposium that people have been attending uh, pretty well. We're now in the fourth, fourth uh, year of it. Um, and our first uh, transaortic case uh, was in 2013. And this is how the approvals kind of came out by the FDA. So, so far uh, to date, we've done 250 cases, a combination of uh, commercial cases and um, research-oriented cases. Um, uh, we've had only one death at 30 days, and we've had 18 deaths out to one year. So pretty remarkable outcomes, I would say, um, uh, within UW. 75% um, or so of cases are done transfemoral. These days, most of those cases are not done with general anesthesia. They're done with just moderate sedation, uh, similar to having a, a standard cath. Um, we do have uh, the anesthesiologist in the room providing that sedation, but, um, but that's just because if, in case something goes wrong, they can convert quickly. And nowadays, with that approach, a, a, a transfemoral case from skin to close, you know, skin access to closure is about 30 to 45 minutes. So really, things have become streamlined. And there's a big push in the country to go towards this sort of minimalistic approach. Because the whole catheter, radial art lines, goes in. Um, we go surgical cut down to get the, the device in. This is back 2012 now. Um, it just this sort of in negotiation, thinking that maybe we can start to push it to three cases a day. We haven't gotten to that point yet, but I think that's coming. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the median length of stay is about three days. So our fourth annual symposium is going to be in October. We haven't yet secured a date at the Monona Terrace, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll all be sending out reminders on that. So you're welcome to, if you want to see cases in action um, and cases that don't go well and how we recovered from those, this is, a, this is a place to be. We've also got a program that we adopted from the surgeons, actually, a gloves-on program where we have faculty, both cardiac surgeons, uh, 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 procedural uh, echocardiographers and interventional cardiologists who've uh, wanted to participate in our procedures and kind of a closer, intimate observer kind of uh, method. That's a gloves on program, and we've had about f we've had four um, faculty members um, from a variety of different institutions come to to learn and and um, and be able to share that experience back with their groups. And of course, it's been a, a boon for our fellowship program. In fact, I'm hearing that those places that don't do transcatheter valve programs suffer from not having um, a ideal fellows, because fellows have now learned, residents have now learned that going into a fellowship program that does this procedure is probably a good thing compared to a place that doesn't. Um, so it's a, it's a big boon. In terms of research, we're involved with the multicenter trials, as, as I'd mentioned. But also, um, we do a lot of uh, in local research, too. Um, both the surgeons, as mentioned, uh, Ashish Chada is doing a, a research project um, that's going back and studying the right ventricle and in how it may relate to outcomes both in surgery and with the uh, transcatheter valve. And it may be a better uh, measure of um, poor outcomes compared to high PA pressure. So that's something to stay tuned on. So that's exciting. Uh, our group, as uh, Dr. Hamden has mentioned, is, has been interested in uh, one of the aspects is to, to merge um, imaging information that we readily use uh, currently. That big monitor, that big, um, I don't know, 60-inch monitor that we, well, we have uh, has a lot of smaller sort of um, sub-monitors kind of built in within it and, um, and imaging. 
right now our echo images are separately displayed and so it takes um, a, someone to kind of cognitively integrate um, you know those images and think about things in three dimensions um, and so that's what our training is and that's what we do but I, I feel that we could do this better and potentially merging that information in a co-registration way um, could be better and so our research in the lab is to focus on how can we um, track the ultrasound catheter create an environment where it matches the x-ray environment and then have a display that inverts things so instead of it being deployed under an x-ray background instead it's deployed under an echo background um, so these are areas that uh, we're, we're working on and developing hardware and software tools to to kind of work flow, uh, work through um, so finally I just had a couple of cases um, so the, in the early experience this would have been in early Jan uh, 2012 um, certainly not the first case, but an early case. This was a prohibitive risk case. 91-year-old woman admitted with a CHF exacerbation, a story that we've heard over and over again. Um, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're listened to, and they, someone did hear this murmur. The echo was done. The mean gradient was 54. Ejection fraction was normal, so in that more common category. They had a variety of other comorbidities. The surgeons deemed to be inoperable primarily on the basis of frailty because their STS score was you know, just at the borderline of 10. And if you look at their, uh, at those days we were doing transesophageal echoes in everyone. We don't do that anymore, but this nevertheless, this is their her transesophageal echo. It, this is the aortic valve, and it, and it doesn't take an experienced echocardiographer to see that a, with an ejection fraction of 70%, this thing isn't moving at all, right? It's hardly just squeaking open. So there's no reason, there's no wonder why she's developed congestive heart failure. So here we are, we have the device um, in place, we're rapid pacing here, this is the first generation Sapien valve. I'll point out how big this you know, delivery system is comparison to the, her aorta. So this was put in under a surgical cutdown, uh, actually, uh, ephemeral cutdown. So the device is placed. I'll also have you sort of sit and pause. So here we are, we've got the device, device up. This is kind of a video loop that's real time, so I have not slowed it down. But this is where, <laughs> this is where we were, so we have no blood pressure at this point. We're uh, inflating the valve, we're counting, we are told to count up to five seconds. And so this five seconds in, in 2012 has become a lot shorter in uh, 2016. Um, and so, as you can see, and we, we kind of fill up the contrast, you know, so a lot has changed since then. Uh, and after you see the result, the result was fine. You know, the patient did well, the, the, there was no paravalvular leak, we do an aerogram, we make sure the coronary arteries are still intact, uh, everything comes out and she did great. And her vascular repair was done and she had a good outcome and you know, she went home and, and, and was just fine. Um, dial it forward, okay, now this is more recent. This would have been towards the end of last year. An 83-year-old with aortic stenosis had class uh, stage three uh, CKD, um, had a history of limited scleroderma and chronic iron deficiency thought to be um, partly related to her uh, reflux disease with that. Um, she also had moderate mitral valve stenosis, which we felt was stable and probably didn't um, you know, worsen her overall outcome, uh, her prognosis rather, and she was also frail. And she was also in this high-risk cohort of an SES score of about similar uh, 10%. In her case, she had a, a similar sorts of things. Uh, mean gradient was high, EF was 60, 75%. Um, so really about the same type of case. She was 83, the other, other one was in her 90s. Um, nowadays, we rely not so much on the transesophageal echo, but we rely on the CT scan. So the CT scan is kind of a critical piece. We measure the annular you know, space, we make the device determination and uh, the uh, access approach determination on that. Now you'll see a slightly different. Now this is the Sapien S3. You see how quickly that went up? So we, um, we rapid pace here, the pacemaker's there. You don't see a transesophageal echo, right? You don't see an echo probe sitting in here because this was done under moderate sedation, so there's no probe in here. We use surface echo to help monitor the procedure. Um, the device went up and um, there's just a minimal amount of contrast used, and this is that sort of typical 30 to 45 minute skin to skin kind of case that we're, that we're doing now. So to conclude, um, you know, tab, whether or not you agree with me in the terms of my beginning slide, I think most, I'm hoping that most people would at least um, admit that TAVR is a significant medical breakthrough in a long time. Uh, I think uh, what we've seen at UW now is that TAVR is the standard of care for patients with severe aortic valve stenosis who are at least high risk for surgical AVR, and the data is still pending on the intermediate risk. 
and we'll see about low risk later. Uh, multidisciplinary collaboration and an emphasis on quality, I think, is required for the, um, for the best outcomes of these patients. And it's been my privilege to be involved with a team that's been so fantastic in working together to make, make these outcomes the best for our patients. So we are now, you know, we're, we have this valve clinic operational, um, and uh, we're seeing patients who are transferred to us um, who have moderate AS. You know, they're not ready for a valve replacement but we track them, so that's one avenue to help uh, primary care doctors, because if they fall through the cracks, the, the worst thing is sudden death um, later on. Uh, or severe aortic stenosis that uh, needs an evaluation for a repair, or replacement rather. Um, Dr. Jamelli yesterday at Cardiology Grand Rounds talked about, and as well as Dr. D. Oliveira talked about uh, mitral valve regurgitation. So there's some transcatheter options uh, that are uh, current and coming along the pipeline for uh, mitral valve regurgitation, so we're seeking out those patients too. And um, this is our TAVR coordinator hotline, um, so if you have a, such a patient or you have any questions about the, the program itself, you can certainly contact me or any of the TAVR operators uh, or their valve coordinator. And with that, I think I'll stop here and I'll thank you for your attention and answer any questions you may have. Yeah. I don't have any uh, figures related to the overall infection rate. Well, we, we, the, the risk of endocarditis itself, the just valvular endocarditis, does not seem to be any different, you know, between a prosthetic valve. Now, the, the data are limited on that. You know, the, the, once patients are out beyond a year, that's when uh, consistent registry tracking becomes, you know, challenging. But within a year, we're not seeing any differences. Certainly, there were no differences seen in those low event outcomes. Of, of endocarditis um, with uh, this. Now, in terms of surgical, you know, incisional-related complications, I think, um, you know, that's, that's another question. I don't have specific data. I can only imagine that's much higher because the risk of access site complication from a transcatheter valve is so remote that we don't even consider it in our consent process. We have time for... Oh, the cost is, yeah, it's big. It's, you know, so... So when we, um, you know, initially when we talk about uh, um, cost, you know, we had to go through uh, the tech access committee, which is a hospital thing, but also there was a committee of um, local payers, Unity, Dean, and so on. And boy, there was, you know, there was a lot of um, resistance, you know, in the early days. This is dialing back to 2011. We knew that the device was FDA approved, because that was approved in November 2011. Uh, we had our meeting in December of that same year, anticipating our first case to be in January of 2012. And we, you know, the, these providers who are typically supplemental providers had a hard time with it. So in terms of absolute cost, we're still at around a $30,000 valve uh, versus a uh, four or $5,000 valve. So 30,000 is for TAVR and, and uh, you know, five, four or 5,000. The rest of the inpatient stay um, is not as much, you know, so there, the differential isn't as much when you compare the two. Um, but the biggest bulk of the cost differential is still the valve. And as I mentioned, you know, we have seen this before. We saw this with implantable cardiac defibrillators um, in the past when you only had one vendor. It was just out of reach for as many, you know, um, providers, per payers rather. Um, but then as the, the devices became more online, more vendors started to produce them, the cost started to come down. We have time for only one more question, and Amish, if you don't mind repeating the question so that... Absolutely, uh, yeah. When, when you auscultate for aortic stenosis, do you place your stethoscope directly on the skin, or do you listen to the patient's pulse? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, it really depends. Uh, if uh, they're sitting in a wheelchair hunched over with kyphosis, to get them up and, you know, get them out of their clothing can be challenging. A lot of the patients will see, I'll be totally honest with you, they've already had their echocardiogram. And so really at this point, I'm doing it something to, con to confirm. Now, if, you're, if you sort of ask yourself, is it going to matter? Uh, for aortic valve stenosis, um, when it gets to be very severe, it can be very hard to hear. When you're not opening that valve very much, you're not having much flow. And that's commonly seen when you have that, uh, that low flow, low gradient type of aortic valve stenosis. 
So really, um, you should be placing on the skin. I, what I try to do in the clinic as best as I can is to reach under the skin in those patients where they're not able to kind of completely disrobe. Great. Thank you, Amish, for the excellent talk.